Hello, it's Scott Manley here. I wanted to make a bit of a follow-up to yesterday's video about the Zero-G flight because I actually got really fascinated by the 727 and the actual mechanics of the Zero-G flight. You know, obviously I'm, I'm doing the whole pilot thing right now, so I'm really thinking hard about this. And a bunch of you had asked, you know, what is, why did they use a 727? After all, it's the 21st century. They're building, they're working with NASA to help build literal, you know, space technology. And yet they're using an aircraft from 1976, right? This is almost a 50 year old thing and there's barely a computer in the cockpit. And then while that is very cool, it's not like, you know, many other aircraft that are flying these days. You know, if you look at, there aren't that many 727s flying around the US anymore, but they are flying in like Africa and things like that, where there are different regulations and they're, they're okay with using perhaps a older aircraft. So like, first of all, I want you to get an idea of how accurate you have to be flying a zero G trajectory. So if you think about it, what you have to do is fly in such a way that the object remains within the confines of the cabin in a ballistic arc, right? And that, if you think about it, is a bit like lane following, right? You've driven a car down the highway and you're trying to follow a lane and there's a curve and whatever. That lane is roughly the same width as an aircraft, right? So it's, if you can keep your car in lane, you are flying as good as that aircraft. Except that aircraft is going into this maneuver at 400 knots, right? Then you're now going 10 times faster down the road than you're used to. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, as you are, are going over this, you have to very precisely follow the speed. Because if you're off by just a little bit, if you're if you're off by, you know, a one mile per hour acceleration over a few seconds, over 10 seconds, you're going to hit the back at 10 miles an hour. Over 20 seconds, you're hitting at 20 miles per hour. That is, you know, you can fall down the back of that thing very quickly if you don't get your speed lined up correctly. Now, on top of this, they're going through huge ranges in altitude. And as they're going through different ranges in altitude, their speed is changing. And as the speed changes and the pressure of the atmosphere changes, first of all, your engine performance changes and your control surfaces, right? Those elevators and uh, ailerons and those are getting less effective as you slow down. In fact, sometimes frequently when this thing is at the apogee of its arc, it is technically moving slower than its stall speed. And you might think, oh my God, that plane is going to fall out of the sky. Well, yes, it is. It's going to fall back down on a 1G trajectory. But the reason they can do this is because stall speed is all about the speed at which the aircraft can maintain 1G of lift, right? And so it, since they're maintaining 0Gs of lift, it doesn't matter what speed they're going, but ideally you want some horizontal speed so that when you come out of this, you are in fact pointing the right way. You want to continue controlling it. So yeah, understand that, imagine that not only as you're, you're going faster, whatever, you have to turn harder as you slow down <laughs> to maintain the angle that you're supposed to. Yeah, and then of course you've got other complications like winds and turbulence. Yes, isn't it fun? So the 727 has an, an advantage over other aircraft in this because if you have, as you're basically going through the zero G portion, you have to offset the amount of drag, right? You have to exactly balance the amount of aerodynamic drag you're getting. And as you're going up different altitudes, you're getting different drag and you're also getting different power out of your engines. So the 727 uh, has the advantage that it's a tri-jet. It has three engines, one of which is basically right down the middle on the back, fed by an S duct with two on pods either side. So zero G, they fly with just that one engine in the middle providing thrust during the zero G portion with the two engines on the side basically delivering idle, right? I mean, they're not generating zero thrust, but they're generating the lowest amount of thrust that is reasonable. And by having that engine lined up down the middle, when they change the throttle to keep the, you know, keep the passengers in the middle, they're not producing any torque 
Whereas if you've got, say, an Airbus with wing-mounted engines, as you increase the thrust, those engines are below the centre of mass, the plane is pitching up. As you reduce the thrust, the plane is pushing down. You have to combat that. And that was also true for the KC-135 that NASA used for a long time. Uh, actually, NASA used four, I believe, KC-145s, all called Weightless Wonder. Weightless Wonder 1, 2, 3, and 4. So that sort of brings me to why uh, Zero-G Corporation ended up using this. Now, sure, it's great that it has this little uh, this single engine mode, right? But... <laughs> The, the the real the truth is they were more interested in the administrative the regulations or whatever that would simplify them getting a flight license and they obviously had to work with more stringent rules than nasa or the military right because they were operating something that was essentially it's called like section 121 of the federal aviation regulations like <laughs> This is this is incredibly deep and complicated. It tells you exactly what you can do. So they had to demonstrate that what they were going to do with the Zero-G flights was totally possible for this aircraft. And if you've ever looked at the operating handbook for many aircraft, they will have specifications saying like, oh, you can only fly inverted for this amount of time. You can only fly at Zero-G for a certain amount of time. Frequently, there are engines which just won't get the oil, cool, the cooling oil fed through them if there's no gravity on there. So you very quickly will ruin your engine if you try to do zero G flight in many aircraft. The and there's others that you know they have limited negative Gs and all sorts of fun rules like that. So you have to go over and validate like every single system. It's not just the engines, right? It's the hydraulic system that feeds stuff. It's the control cables, it's, yeah, I don't know, fuel distribution systems. Now, NASA, of course, they'd operated these KC-135s. That meant they had a lot of data, a lot of engineering, uh, you know, history that could be used by people developing new stuff. Now, the thing is, getting a KC-135 wasn't particularly easy because most of the those, they're all with the military, and very nobody was getting rid of them nobody was selling them so the were interested so i guess zero gravity were looking for similar things things that shared flight hardware heritage and the boeing 707 is very very similar they were designed around the same time they have a four engine layout they literally have many systems that are identical but the 707 well it was you know obviously the first really big successful passenger airliner but it had been largely retired in the US by the 1980s. And in the mid 90s, you couldn't really get them that easily. The 727 was the sort of next step along the line and it still shared a lot of flight heritage. So the 727 was designed by Boeing essentially as the sort of next step in their jet revolution. The 707 was like, hey, you can now fly from one big city to another faster than ever before but you need big city airports. You need a 10,000 foot runway and you need big air stairs to get everyone in and out. The 707 was, uh, 727 was designed for small regional airports. It had a much shorter range, but it only had three engines and it could land on a 4,500 foot runway. And for bonus points, since uh, you know they wanted to be as independent as possible, it had these cool air stairs that came down at the back, so you could didn't even have to wait for the local ground services to come up with anything. And those air stairs are, of course, are key to one of the cool stories or interesting stories about the history of uh, air, well, air travel, air hijacking, the DB Cooper story, where somebody hijacks a 727 and eventually escapes by parachuting out the back and has never been seen from again. And while that's the most famous one, it wasn't the only one. There were several other people that tried this same thing and got apprehended. The FAA eventually required Boeing to fix, the fa fix this and stop the, the air stair from being able to open in flight. Uh, like actually, just incidentally, the CIA apparently looked, or the FBI looked at this and they found that they could only lower a certain amount. They couldn't open it all the way because the hydraulics wouldn't push it that far and it would also change the aerodynamics of the aircraft. So if you ever see like, you know, TV 
recreations of this. They don't lower all the way down and have DB like sort of your swan dive off of there. He'd have to sort of crawl through the, the gap that was available due to the air pressure. Uh, yeah, but and by the way, those air stairs, very useful if you're, say, operating a zero gravity flight out of, you know, FBOs rather than having to operate, rather than trying to, say, you know, take your plane over to the departure gates for a regular flight, you know? Uh, it, it certainly simplifies things. I still think it's really cool. Anyway, sorry, the FBI, not the FBI, the FAA required that they have a modification to do this. And Boeing came up with something which was basically a vane that when the aircraft was in flight, it would push on this and it would, you know, it would be spring loaded to spring back. But when they were going fast enough, it would push down and lock some pins into place and stop the thing from opening. This device was called the Cooper vane. So, yes, even if he did fall out and die or whatever, he is still uh, immortalized today in the design of the 727. So yeah, I, I think around the 90s when uh, Zero Gravity Corporation were looking for aircraft, 727s were being phased out by a lot of carriers uh, because they were getting replaced by other more efficient aircraft such as the 737. Uh, there was also the issue that the 727s used very old low bypass turbojets and therefore were very, very loud and to fix them to operate at US airports, they at some point would have to get fitted with hush kits. These are basically exhaust mixers, they're called. And what they do is they break up the sort of uh, very clean jet surface so that it mixes more cleanly and less noisily, right? It makes smaller eddies or whatever. I don't know, I want to I want to see someone really talk about this. So I think that's why they ended up with this particular 727, because, uh, you know, it, it fit all their criteria. And they did still need to make modifications. One modification they did was the, the hydraulic system, which normally would rely on gravity to, uh, you know, to hold stuff in through, like, bleed lines and things like that. In the end, they were able to you know, create a closed cycle system that would work even in zero G, even in negative Gs. And the other thing they added was a G meter, which you would obviously measure their performance. So there's a bit of circuitry in this that would actually display what the, the pilots need to know, along with the rubber ducky that, that is doing its job. And you know, those were the main things. These are actually documented in a patent that they filed for operating an aircraft part-time as a cargo plane and part-time is a zero-G entertainment thing. And the whole patent's all about how to switch it back and forth very, very quickly and cost-effectively. I don't think they ever did that. But yeah, the plane they specifically got was built in the 1976, and it was flown by Braniff Airlines. And along the way, it sort of shifted from one company to another. It ended up with Pan Am at one point. And I think the final operator was Delta Shuttle before it was then taken and converted into a cargo aircraft. The windows were closed up and then operated like that for a while before being, uh, before Zero G got it. And I think they were probably responsible for putting on the wingtips, you know, the little uh, wingtip devices. I'm not sure if they did the hush kit, but they might have done it around that time because it was come, it was going to be required around 2015. Now, one of the things that surprised a lot of people was that these things are being flown manually rather than, uh, you know, by a computer. And actually, Tom Scott did a cool video where he looked at the European version. Now, that is on an Airbus, and Europe used to have an Airbus 300. Now, I think it's an Airbus 310. But they showed it being flown by three people working the controls simultaneously. One on the right was doing the, the pitch control with the yoke. The one, uh, the guy on the left, was controlling the rudder with his feet and giving very small inputs to the roll using like elastic bands attached to the yoke. And then the third person was in the middle very carefully controlling the, the throttles, right? And you know, that does remind me, like, God, it makes me think of Pacific Rim, right? You know, you get it, we gotta like merge our brains and control this beast. Uh, that was extraordinarily cool, but yeah, nobody, flies these things with computers and the reason is it's aviation and getting an autopilot 
validated for this wild and crazy maneuver would be just stupidly expensive when they can just f ask people to fly it, right? Basically, any modification is treated with great suspicion by the FAA, right? <laughs> And I can totally see why, you know, you want to minimize as much as possible. And that's, you know, if you want to operate a company on a budget, that's what you're going to do. I believe that Zero G Corp may actually be buying more 727s. That was the statement made a couple of years ago by the CEO. And they just got our, you know, Series B funding to actually do this. Their plans may have changed in the meantime, but uh, I think the availability is still good. They might even be able to get one which has a bit more of a glass cockpit as they are being retired now by, uh, you know, like UPS and things like that. Also, I do find it fascinating that the engine noise control systems, one of the companies that sells those is Federal Express. You think of like they, they ship stuff around. Well, they also sell you parts for your aircraft because they had to develop their own like engine mixing system to make them quiet enough to continue operate in the US. And speaking of cockpit, or sorry, noise in general, one of the cooler things I found was when I got the footage from, you know, from the company, they sent me it, and I loaded it into my audio editor, or my video editor, and the very first thing I saw was the sound going up and down, and I was like, oh, you can totally see when we're at the peaks and we're at the troughs, right? It gets really loud when they start to pull out of this because they have to light up all the engines or like, not so much light up, but throttle up all those engines. And then when they get to the top of the arc, they have to throttle the things back. And instead you hear everyone screaming and squealing with delight. And, and the other thing that actually caught me by surprise was, well, when you look at these very exaggerated maneuvers, right? You might think, well, of course, if you're gonna do really big maneuvers like that in a plane, you're gonna want it to be as light as possible. You're gonna want the minimum fuel load on this thing, but no, they're doing zero G flight. They need to have those fuel tanks filled up as much as possible so that there's no gap in the tanks, right? So the void spaces, never end up feeding the engines because you want to make sure your engines don't go out when you're getting ready to pull out of this steep climb, right? Yeah, this was an absolutely fascinating uh, experience. And, and now I'm sort of really interested in finding more about airliners. Because, <laughs> you know, that's me. I can't look at a piece of technology and not want to learn more. I saw like a cool image of a coffee table, which is made of a, an exhaust mixer from a 727. And it was like, I want that. I don't want to have to move it because it weighs about the same as me. <laughs> but it looks like an enormously cool piece of hardware, like modern art. So like, I, I know this has been a bit rambling, but uh, I did clear up a bunch of things that uh, people had asked in the comments. And I thought you guys might like to know. So yeah, um, thanks for watching. Fly safe.